So good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to the launch of the Physiological Society report on the future of interdisciplinary research beyond REF 2021. Uh, my name is David Patterson and I'm the president of the Physiological Society and also head of the Department of Physiology, Anatomy and Genetics at the University of Oxford, where I am a professor. Uh, as you know, Parliament's decision to close the building at fairly short notice has meant that we've had to reconvene online also at quite short notice. And I'm very grateful for everyone that has been able to readjust their schedule to be with us here this evening. This week, of course, in the United Kingdom, all eyes have been focused on Glasgow with COP26 and the importance of interdisciplinary research has never been so important. Uh, from climate change to pandemics like COVID-19, the challenges faced by humanity require an interdisciplinary approach to meet those challenges. Our new report, which we are launching this evening, has focused on the structures that underpin interdisciplinary research. And of interest, what my colleagues have really found is that whilst these structures can be beneficial, they can also present a hindrance to new developments and research ideas. And this evening, we're going to hear from a number of experts where we will be looking directly at some of the recommendations that are coming out of our new report, which can be found at fissoc.org forward slash interdisciplinary. And I would really hope that you will take some time to have a look at the report. And especially for those of you that would like a hard copy, uh, which we were going to give to you this evening, uh, we have plenty at headquarters to pass on to you. Um, in order to get to the final report, uh, uh, my colleagues convened an expert panel where they considered the interdisciplinary research landscape in the United Kingdom, and, and they took uh, counsel and information from a number of learned societies, such as the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Biology, uh, the Royal Society itself, Research England, uh, Campaign for Science and Engineering, Guild HE, and a number of Russell Group universities. I would like to finish uh, by thanking the review group for all the hard work that they put into the report, and in particular, uh, Professor David Eisner from the University of Manchester, who chaired uh, the working group. And this evening, uh, David will chair the session which we're about to start. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to hand over to him, and, and I look forward to, to the discussions. Um, David, over to you. Okay, well, th thank you very much, David, and good evening to everyone. So as the report, which you'll read, makes clear, interdisciplinary research is of relevance to many areas, and this is reflected by our group of panelists tonight. My first pleasant duty is to introduce them briefly, and I'm going to do that in the order in which they're speaking. So we have Dan King from Research Consulting, who is the primary author of the report. Stephanie Smith, Head of Policy for the Russell Group of Universities. Ian Viney, who is Director of Strategic Evaluation and Impact at UKRI. Jen McCall, Consultant and Book Commissioning Editor at Emerald Press. And last but certainly not least, Natalie Bohm, who is Medical Director at Pfizer. Well, I was delighted to be asked to chair the steering group for the report. What I think is particularly important, actually, is that physiologists were in the minority on the steering group. And certainly the contributions of the others helped to produce an outwardly facing report. My own interest in the area of interdisciplinary research comes partly from having served on previous three RAE and REF exercises, but perhaps more so like many other physiologists, I regard interdisciplinary research as vital. So much of our research depends, for example, on input from the physical sciences, 
and has the ultimate aim of underpinning clinical developments. And physiology is therefore a truly interdisciplinary science. Enough of me for now, I think it's time to get on to the real reason for tonight's webinar. And I'd like to begin by asking Dan King from Research Consulting to introduce the report. Dan. Thank you, David. Um, this report aims to provide a greater understanding of how the research excellence framework through its entire process affects interdisciplinary research. It recognises a research landscape where REF is both an important and resource intensive process for universities. And it's a process that is organised around a discipline led structure and have been sustained questions around the representation of interdisciplinary research within REF and in previous research assessment exercises. The report provides an input to the future research assessment program that will shape future approaches. And in delivering this work, we took inputs from university research leaders, a range of researchers at different career stages, working across a range of disciplines and considered relevant perspectives from stakeholders in industry and in publishing. In total, nearly 50 people contributed to this report through the steering group via interviews and focus groups. The report considers elements around why interdisciplinary research matters and a summary of some of the previous evidence uh, in this area. Chapter three looks at developing practice uh, and understanding for interdisciplinary research, including the interpretations of, of what is interdisciplinary research, trust and confidence in peer review and reward and recognition elements. This also considers the difficulties of metrics to address some of the basic questions, such as how much research is interdisciplinary. How the REF process influences interdisciplinary research and the perspectives of researchers towards this is considered further in chapter four. And finally, we make 10 recommendations for the future of research assessment to, and to address a wider set of issues for interdisciplinary research uh, in the future. In delivering this work, we saw three important features in the landscape of research that have strongly influenced the report and the recommendations. Firstly, that concerns around interdisciplinary research uh, and national research assessment have been reported consistently over many years. Indeed, one of the reports cited uh, is a comprehensive review from Scotland back in 1997, but many of their observations then still stand. And with this in mind, we consider if it is time for REF to more strongly encourage and reward interdisciplinary research within its structure and approach. Secondly, interdisciplinary research covers a wide spectrum of activity, and we invariably lack the common language to properly communicate and distinguish the characteristics of interdisciplinary research. An important factor identified is the, the cognitive distance between disciplines. Are they near or far? And this does strongly influence many of the perceived barriers and challenges researchers face. For example, how difficult it is for the researchers to build a working collaboration in the first place the ability to access funding from a suitable sponsor, the ability for the research team to publish early findings, and how well the research team, their outputs and their impact can then be reflected within a REF organised around units of assessment. And thirdly, the increasing significance of interdisciplinary research in terms of the landscape of grant funding for mission and challenge led research and many participants commented on a perceived imbalance between expectations and competitions for research grants, which strongly reward and encourage interdisciplinarity and how interdisciplinary research is featured within REF itself. It should be noted the report considers the wider REF process. This isn't just about what happens from the point of submission to the point of results. Many of the important observations and issues are upstream of the point of submission as universities undertake the significant ta task of selection and prioritization for their REF submission. So in total, the report identifies 10 recommendations. Four are focused on the future of research assessment, where we recommend that a future exercise adopts a structure that explicitly identifies and rewards research founded on interdisciplinary approaches. And the remainder consider some of the wider recommendations for interdisciplinary research, addressing a number of gaps, underpinning issues and opportunities that emerged uh, through the course of the study. It will be no surprise that trust and confidence in peer review features strongly in the report and the recommendations. And here taking a wider view has been helpful, allowing us to consider how interdisciplinary research is handled in research grant competitions and by publishers, recognizing the continuing importance of publications in research assessment. The report makes recommendations for funders and publishers, suggesting measures to enhance capacity and capability for peer review of interdisciplinary research. 
And we also consider the role that professional and learned societies can play by working together to support and facilitate the development of interdisciplinary networks and collaborations, particularly uh, of, of benefit for members who are early career researchers, and potentially where the, the cognitive distance between disciplines is greater and may not more, more uh, naturally occur. Finally, I'd just like to add my own thanks to, to David and the excellent steering group, to the participants who gave time and insights to the review and to the wider team at Research Consulting, but particularly to Andrew and Tom at the Physiological Society for numerous inputs, advice and support along the way. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. So our, our next presentation is going to be given by Stephanie Smith from the Russell Group, on the, who's going to address the impact of interdisciplinary research on higher education institutions. Steph. Thanks very much. Um, so I've been asked to briefly speak about why we think IDR matters to universities, as well as a bit about the policy environment for interdisciplinary research. Um, as mentioned earlier, we already know that some of the trickiest questions, so what are often called wicked problems facing the world today, require interdisciplinary approaches to solve them. So we've had climate change, mentioned, which is very topical for this week. And um, we also have the issue of adapting to a post-COVID society where we already know that things such as vaccine hesitancy um, shows us that science often needs to understand the context in which it operates in order to be effective. And then we also have the challenges of the future. So things such as artificial intelligence and the implications of AI within society and how we live in that. In policy terms, I'd say that we have a number of reasons to be positive in terms of the future of IDR. So if we look at the government's recent innovation strategy, it talks both about challenge-led research and mission-orientated R&D. And these are both, um, both areas where interdisciplinary research really comes to the fore. And with the spending review settlement, I think we now have the money in place to make those ambitions a reality and to be able to fund those programs going forward. Um, the other positive, of course, is that universities are long-standing supporters of interdisciplinary um, uh, approaches to research. So, for example, I think it, it's 13 years ago that UCL first began what they call their Grand Challenges Initiative. So this is a programme where UCL sat down and consulted with community around what it saw as the biggest challenges facing humanity and then went about um, looking at how to fund and support interdisciplinary research teams to address those challenges. And those are things like global health, sustainable cities, and dealing with the impact of transformative technology on society. So I think although we know that challenges still exist, um, uh, again, the trend towards IDR is going in the right direction if we look at publications as well. So there was recent analysis done or commissioned by Nature, for example, that found that modern papers reference and cite publications from three times as many disciplines as they did 50 years ago. And which begs the question, of course, of who conducts this research and are we training the next generation to be able to work in this interdisciplinary um, manner? And again, I think we have reasons to be positive here. Over the past few years, we've seen the rise of new centers for doctoral training, which are aimed explicitly at building capacity in new and emerging interdisciplinary areas. Um, and and you know, if, uh, taken all together, I think this report really can be seen as a positive stepping stone for identifying the still sort of persistent barriers which remain to IDR and how we can work together to overcome them. Thanks very much, Steph. So moving on, um, Ian Viney is going to tell us about funding and the role of UKRI in fostering collaboration. Ian. Thank you. So as many in the audience will recall, um, many on the panel will recall as well, the last major review of the UK Research Councils, chaired by Paul Nurse, contributed to the setting up of UKRI, UK Research and Innovation. The formation of UKRI brought all seven research councils into a single organisation, along with Innovate UK and the newly formed Research England, which is of course responsible for managing the REF. The NURSE review strongly emphasised the need to ensure the health of a broad set of research disciplines, but also for an uninhibited flow of people and ideas across disciplines 
and the need for a wide range of expertise in assessing multi and interdisciplinary proposals for funding. A major objective in forming UKRI was therefore to strengthen working between research councils and to support interdisciplinary thinking. In its first three years of operation, I suggest that there is a lot of evidence of this happening, far beyond the scale possible or likely in previous arrangements, which is a cause for optimism for interdisciplinary research. And I think I share some of the optimism that Stephanie has just outlined. Obviously, I would highlight the UKRI and NIHR coordinated responses to the pandemic, which clearly MRC colleagues played an important part. This resulted in the MRC leading a diverse and in some cases quite complex 256 million pound portfolio of new and largely interdisciplinary COVID-19 research projects. With a third of this funding coming from partners across UKRI, government and other, other funding agencies. I'd also highlight um, as a new development, uh, the UKRI Strategic Priorities Fund. This is a novel UKRI wide initiative which has committed 830 million pounds across, uh, it's focused on multi and interdisciplinary research across 34 themes. And I think a great example uh, within this is the 24 million pound Adolescence, Mental Health and the Developing Mind program, which has been recently launched and jointly scoped between the MRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Economic and Social Sciences Research Council. So the MRC's role within UKRI as a research council is less focused solely on our delegated budget, which is about 800 million, but about the issues that matter to biomedical research and the case for a health relevant research spend, which now totals 1.5 billion across UKRI and in which each of the nine councils is a stakeholder. As a mission focused research council, the MRC and more importantly, our grant awarding boards and panels are interested in what needs to be done to improve human health. The MRC regularly funds work with a substantial social science element, and over the last decade has substantially ramped up funding for data science, uh, making hundreds of millions of pounds of investment in that area. In addition, for the last 15 years, almost all the growth in MRC funding, when there has been any growth, has been used to build up experimental medicine and translational research efforts which has demonstrated an exceptional return and is highly interdisciplinary. I would emphasize that while an important lever, the REF process won't address all aspects of encouraging interdisciplinary research. And so I'm really pleased to see the report's involvement with stakeholders such as industry um, and publishers and so on. I'm also very pleased to see recommendations such as recommendation 10, focusing on career pathways. And I would cite an example of the UK research and innovation, innovation Scholars Programme piloted in 2020. This was aimed at diversification of career paths, supporting secondments across the biomedical sector, enabling porosity between academia, industry and the NHS. And having been a commissioner of some of the research post REF 2014, substantial challenges in agreeing what interdisciplinary research is, and particularly how to measure it, remain. Not all is evident in the analysis of publications. So I really look forward to discussing the report more fully this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. As we've heard, considerable amount of the report addresses publication. So I'd now like to ask Jen McCall to tell us about interdisciplinary research, publishing and promoting collaboration. Uh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here today. And thank you, David, Dan, and all involved for an incredibly useful and insightful report, which has consumed me today, I have to say, while I was preparing this talk. Um, so I perhaps represent a slightly different perspective on the panel. Um, I come from a social science publisher, um, and my background is in academic books rather than journals. But I think the report has some really interesting sections looking at, um, as Dan sort of referenced in his introduction, the far and near in interdisciplinary research and with the idea that the far is much more difficult than the near in terms of peer review, recognition, career progression, ref assessment, bibliometrics, etc. But um, just before I sort of talk about publishing in detail, I, I would uh, shout out that the collaboration of social sciences and life sciences is so crucial when trying to address the grand societal challenges and sustainable development goals. 
uh, really good in the report to see a case study in, uh, highlighting the role of the arts and humanities, for example, here in a collaborative project involving the Royal College of Speech and Drama um, and the University of Surrey. But I'm primarily talking about the role that publishers play in interdis interdisciplinary research and how have they responded to the push towards um, IDR coming from uh, funding bodies, etc. It was really good to read in the report that there is a perception that the publishing landscape shows an improving picture for interdisciplinary research. And I'd say it's certainly true that publishers have come up with some quite innovative ways of, of publishing such research over recent years. Um, the range of interdisciplinary publishing venues has broadened hugely um, with the rise of the OA Mega Journal, for example. Some of you might have seen a very recent announcement from Cambridge University Press on a new journals concept research directions, um, which provides an alternative to the traditional journal format and is going to foster collaboration by bringing researchers together to address fundamental questions which cut across the disciplines. Here at Emerald, which is where I'm based, we've long been a publisher focused on the impact of the research we publish. Um, and as signatures of the SDG Publishers Compact, we've realigned our entire publishing strategy around four mission-led goals, with each of them responding to a number of the UN SDGs. Our Emerald Open Research Platform has allowed us to publish a range of research outputs, so not just original research articles, but case studies, data notes, methodologies, um, and they publish within broad, different broad thematic gateways aligned to the UN SDGs. But aside from launching new platforms and new ways of publishing, um, how have publishers adapted to accommodate IDR? I think it's certainly true that publishing interdisciplinary research does call for some special processes and measures, um, particularly but not exclusively related to peer review. It seems to be widely understood across publishers that there are challenges, additional resources and additional costs in undertaking peer review of IDR articles and books. They require more careful shepherding through the process than straight disciplinary projects uh, might call for. Um, and it's interesting to see some innovative practices proliferating here within publishing. Um, for example, the idea of iterative publishing, a, a, a dynamic publishing process where an article uh, grows and changes in response to peer review. Uh, group peer review, preprints, of course, the rise of the preprint um, last year during the pandemic um, is, is, I think, having some widespread changes in the industry and things like video peer review. Our own Emerald uh, open research platform that I mentioned before, um, for, for example, operates an open peer review uh, system where, whereby the research output is made Im immediately visible. Um, and then the peer review takes place in a transparent and dynamic and open process. You'll see that the report recommends addressing trust, transparency and confidence in peer review and that funders and publishers should work together to identify specific measures to enhance uh, capacity and capability for interdisciplinary peer review across all types of review. And there are certainly some interesting ideas around creating a framework for peer review and addressing questions relating to the formulation of the research question, the methodology, how the disciplines involved have been integrated, um, how the collaboration has been organized and how it's been led, the communication and the language. Um, and really basing peer review on a common understanding that, that really effective interdisciplinary research is difficult stuff. Um, the report recommendation of the formation of a peer review academy, which is in recommendation number eight, is a particularly useful and interesting one, I think, in the report. And I look forward to um, seeing that come to fruition, I hope. Um, and just turning to um, something that was also mentioned at the beginning, the idea of identifying, uh, tracking and measuring interdisciplinary research. This is a real challenge and it remains for, for publishers, I think, uh, certainly remains for us around tracking interdisciplinary research more effectively at submission and acceptance stage. At Emerald, we ask our authors to outline the nature of the research, why it's interdisciplinary, how they've made it interdisciplinary, what their methods have been when they submit a book proposal to us, for example, but quantifying and categorizing interdis interdisciplinary outputs on a publishing program remains a challenge. We're now tracking published um, research um, that relates to the SDGs, which is a step along the journey, but we're aware that more work is needed. 
In terms of measuring impact, um, as signatories of DORA, the Declaration of Research Assessment, we at Emerald champ champion tools such as Altmetric to complement traditional citation-based metrics, giving a richer understanding of the impact of the content of the article uh, rather than the, the prestige of the journal in which it's published. And it's also interesting to see new ratings and rankings related to the SDGs um, coming up, particularly I mentioned the um, SDG impact intensity rating, which was launched in the spring by Cabells and SJU. We and other publishers are increasingly aware of the need to translate research into other non-traditional forms of content. Um, and at Emerald, we support our authors through the work we're doing on our four Emerald goals mentioned earlier to rework the research into um, engaging digital formats such as podcasts, blog posts, videos and infographics. Um, and there's work to be done there in terms of translating and um, uh, uh, enhancing the impact of research that way. That's it for me. I hope that's given you an insight into what role publishers might play in this space. And I look forward to our ongoing discussions and any questions. Thank you very much, Jen. And, and finally, obviously, interdisciplinary research has a large role in industry. So I'd like to ask Natalie Bohm to tell us about the value of this research to industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. I'm sorry we can't be in person, but it, it's, it's lovely to hear these discussions virtually. I, I think, as David uh, Patterson said right at the start, this is such a hugely topical and important report and it's topical for all of us and I think from an industry perspective it is really interesting to hear some of these different discussions and the reason that I say that is because I think IDR is very much at the core of what we do in, in industry. Industry in the pharmaceutical industry in particular very much sees itself as purpose-driven and that's because we are looking at not just one aspect of research, but at translating research from discovery through to actually re reaching patients at the end of the day. At, at Pfizer, we say what we look to do is bring breakthroughs through to patients. And I think it is that continuity of needing to deliver into the real world that makes IDR so important to us. We're not just looking at a time point, we're looking at a continuity. And what that means, of course, is that we're needing to generate a lot of knowledge for a lot of different questions and for, to answer it from, from multiple perspectives, from the perspective of patients, prescribers, payers, regulators, all through that, policymakers. So, you know, for, for us actually working in that interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary manner is absolutely vital. And of course, we're also doing this at a global scale, which adds in another layer of complexity. So I, I, I think it's, you know, it's even more critical now from an industry perspective, as we are increasingly looking at addressing rarer conditions and orphan conditions, where we are looking at smaller populations. So we're having to consider increasingly what uh, different robust methodologies we're bringing in, um, and also really understanding the value and the impact of what we're doing to healthcare systems. Again, I think all this points to the absolute value of IDR for, for industry. So I guess the key point here is, is how do we as industry then play our role in trying to facilitate IDR? How do we support this? And I think for us that this is, speaks to how we as industry interact in the life sciences ecosystem. For those of you who do work with industry, I think what you'll find is increasingly we talk about partnership models of working. And much as, as, as Ian said that, you know, we very much welcome the concept and the recommendation that comes through, through this report about getting greater experience across different, different sectors with, with things such as secondments. So working towards this partnership model, building on trust, building on relationships rather than just transactional models of way and ways of working are, are absolutely key. I think a case in point in this, and I suppose I'd, I'd be remiss not to mention it, is you know almost the case study we've had with the pandemic. And of course, COVID-19 has been both a complex and a wicked problem all at once with an added layer of utter urgency and, and global importance. And as an industry, it has really brought home to us the absolute importance of the multiple research perspectives that we need. 
if you think about it from, from our perspective, we weren't just asked to develop a vaccine. We had to think also about the engineering required to deliver through complex, for example, cold chain storage. We had to think about how we worked with government scientists to bring these into systems with regulators with understanding you know how to deliver information to to the public in a responsible ethical and appropriate manner to you know so that so that we weren't raising anti-vaccination concerns it has been a huge learning for us as an industry about how we need to work very closely in partnership i would say moving forward, this is what we need to build on. We need to build on this partnership way of working, this ability to work between these different sectors and perspectives, and to put an ask out as well, I think, to, to the research and academic community to, to also really consider their perspectives of working with industry, because I think we have all shifted in how we work together. Problems moving forward aren't just going to be COVID. We, we know this. We've got climate change problems from life sciences, from a pharmaceutical perspective. We see big challenges coming up with antimicrobial resistance. I mean, you know, these, the next pandemic, these problems are going to continue to exist. They're going to be complex. They're going to be wicked. And the way around this is going to be through collaboration and trust. I think and this report highlights that really nicely. So thank you very much, David. And I'm interested to hear the discussion and the questions moving forward. Great, many thanks. That was wicked, as they say. <laughs> okay, so now enough from us and now questions from all the other participants here. How do I see these? I think you can put them on the Q&A line. <clears throat> okay. So the first one is, I think we've already it's been partly answered by Natalie and Jen, but perhaps the other panelists might want to comment on how the pandemic has affected their approach to interdisciplinary research. Do anybody like to jump in? Well, David, I was I was reflecting on on we, we draw on COVID quite a lot through the report simply because I, I I can't imagine in my lifetime I will see another situation where the challenge appeared research was done it affected policy you know, I was kind of hearing about research on the morning and then seeing policy change that evening it was an incredibly concentrated period of time and we, we really felt this was quite an important um, you know the lessons learned from this are really quite significant I think for for interdisciplinary research but it was pointed out to me by several participants that the real you know climate change is the big problem and and the one that is much more intractable in terms of the difficulty and the challenges and requiring much more complex levels of, of interdisciplinarity to to address um, moving forwards. No, I, sure. I would absolutely echo that. And I, I would say, you know, again, I think this is this is where you have, you know, you talk about distance, but there are these constant touch points. And, you know, from a pharmaceutical uh, point of view, from an industry point of view, of course, climate change, carbon footprint are becoming hugely topical issues for us. And I think it's, you know, these are going to be further areas where we're going to have to find ways of collaborating and, and really stretching the boundaries of, of, of what we traditionally do in research. Ian. Yeah, Dan mentioned something that was interesting, which was the um, the, the the policy impact. And I think um, I think what's quite interesting is um, maybe not strictly interdisciplinary, but cross sectorial working is really really important. So we've heard a lot about the need to have good academic private sector interactions, uh, which is of course cross sector. The pandemic highlighted that that interface between scientific advice and uh, policy makers is really, really important. Those people may share similar disciplinary background, but they're working in different sectors and they're really that's really important to cross that that division well. And obviously we want some of those great things um, that were born out of necessity in the pandemic to persist in, in future. Great. 
Okay, moving on, another question we have turns to the role of early career researchers and asks, how can we make sure they're recognized and rewarded? And I guess the subtext behind that is in the large teams that are often put together to do interdisciplinary research, it's very easy for early career researchers just to get ignored. Shall I, I come back on that uh, just as a, a starting observation? We saw this um, quite a bit through the, the work, and we specifically set out to, to involve a, a number of early career researchers in the, the report to, to look at that. And, and very much this, this links back to the concept of research teams and recognising uh, the, the, the different uh, contributions and inputs um, to research teams, um, which will have different flavours in an interdisciplinary collaboration and scales. And it is about moving beyond that um, that like leading view. The other point we heard about this is, is that um, it was described as the big moments in interdisciplinary research are well catered for and, and published and recognized, but it's those earlier stages when people are developing and exploring um, where I think the, re the re recognition is so important and early career research can have a really valuable contribution in some of these areas, but it's making sure that that work and effort uh, is recognized and, and rewarded in the wider system and it's it's not just about ref it's, it's the way universities work uh, the way people perceive promotions and i think this is why we we concluded around um uh, understanding careers how interdisciplinary research shapes and develops careers because this is part of the visibility uh, of, of of reward and recognition um to encourage that anyone else okay ian Say from a publishing perspective, I think um, there still remains the, the push for an early career researcher to publish in, in um, journals, single discipline journals with high impact factors. And so the point I was making about alternative uh, metrics comes into play here. And as Dan was saying, it's, it's, it's publishing, but it's the whole ecosystem and it's the, it's the kind of the whole measurement and career progression side that would be systemic. <laughs> Um, yeah. Ian, you wanted to say something. Well, it was just that this really touches on the much broader aspect of research culture and, and you know, encouraging a more positive research culture where, um, you know, people can explore in an interdisciplinary way and are recognised and rewarded for it. And I think, um, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of initiatives in this in this area. We can often learn from smaller countries where um where you know they've they've managed to um to to bring all the relevant stakeholders together in a in a in a more effective way than maybe a, a country of our size can and i often look to the the, the netherlands and the netherlands has a, a fantastic initiative called um uh, room for everybody's talent which has brought together you know um medical schools all the universities um because there's there's 14 or 15 in the in the country um all the universities all the funders and has really signed up to a joint um kind of um effort in this area to to properly um uh, get throughout the career pathway better ways of recognizing team scientists um you know properly embedding the 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 aspects of the the dora um initiative that was mentioned earlier so i think all those things kind of need to come together in a concerted way to ensure that um early career researchers do do have the encouragement to to explore and succeed in an interdisciplinary way thanks natalie yeah, and I think to pick up on that as well, the cultural piece on that, I think, and again, it speaks to your previous point, Ian, about the cross-sectoral working as well, because I think, you know, there also needs to be openness to working in different settings. Uh, and 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 I'm not asking everyone to come to industry, that, that wouldn't work either. But what I'm saying is, is that, you know, there it helps to have those different perspectives and to value those. So if someone does come to industry and then goes back into more, you know, more um, academic research, then, you know, I think that experience should be embraced and valued for the value that it, it brings. Useful. Okay, I'm going to move on to a completely different area and use Chair's prerogative to combine three questions we've been asked. So the first one is many of the big questions, if not all, are transnational. What opportunities does the panel see for addressing those 
these with international funding behind them, but also related to that as a question about how much has our inability to reach an agreement on Horizon Europe detracted from um, interdisciplinary research? And also, what about the cut in UK overseas aid funding? If anybody thinks they can address that collection. Um, I can I can have a go Please at addressing a couple of those. Um, so with regard to GCRF, I think that was a situation that that was beyond anyone's control because it 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 was the government level decision around what what to do with the aid budget. I think what uh, the opportunity we have now with the spending review is to say with with the funding in place, what sort of international programs do we do we want to go forward with? So what what forms should we take? And to not be reliant on um, on things like such as those sort of the external budgets to, to, to determine their sort of fate and future. And it, I think this is something that UKRI was looking at before the spending review, and will no doubt um, will come to some conclusions in the next few months. So there are positives there um, around um, what's happening with Horizon. We know that. Um, Today, even we had a number of our European partners come forward and um, and speak on our behalf in a positive way, um, and directed a message towards the European Commission to say that that they didn't want politics to get in the way of um, association. We know that there are a number of in-flight applications, even even as we speak, and I think for for our part, we're encouraging government to to, to send out the message that those will be supported no matter what. Um, and and to continue to push for association as soon as possible. So that that's the message that we can give for now. Um, and then I think, what was the third part of that question? I can't remember, I'm afraid. But it was the more general question about, um, since interdisciplinary research, a lot of it is international, do we need more schemes and more funding to promote international collaborations? Um, I, I, Absolutely, from a de domestic perspective, I think the question was was also hinting at are there sort of are there collaborations that where everyone can put a bit of money into the pot yeah. across countries. I, from what I've been told um, in the past, I think that suffered at times from double jeopardy, um, in, and which is why you know the um, uh, Horizon has been such a successful scheme because it, it's known rules that everyone agrees to. So. Um, so if we were going to down that going to go down that road, one thing I'd say is that they take a lot of time to establish, um, and 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 so I I wouldn't encourage you know coming out of FTAs to have a million of those with a million different countries because they're they're quite difficult to establish and to um, and to get into place and to run. So I'd say that I think Horizon probably remains one of the the best and most successful examples of multi country collaboration really for the UK. Thanks. Anyone else or? Dan? Just, just perhaps just a small comment on the, the global challenges research fund side. I think this was actually came up several times um, in our conversations with participants, uh, uh, purely from the point of view of how well it stimulated interdisciplinary research. So as a, a um, it was established for slightly different reasons, but actually was was widely regarded as being a great um, uh, encourager of, of of interdisciplinary international interdisciplinary research collaborations. Great. Okay, a different area now from from one of the Physiological Society's members, who says from his perspective he sees the life medical science collaborating well with engineering and maths, the physical sciences but sees less, fewer opportunities to collaborate with the social sciences. And he wonders, is this just his perception or others, do others see it as well? And if so, what could be done to address it? And then Jen touched on that in her five minutes. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's um, just his experience. I think it is, uh, as I mentioned, I think the report draws out the, the increasing complexity when you, when you deal with interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity between far disciplines. Um, I think there's often a problem with social scientists and the humanities being brought in as token extra disciplines towards the end of a project. This is something I hear from my authors quite frequently, or used to, um, to finish off a project or do some kind of performance around it rather than 
an embedded truly interdisciplinary project where all the disciplines are involved at the beginning um it is really difficult i mean there are completely different methodologies different languages people talk on they don't understand each other you can say something and think you're being clear and you're being completely misunderstood there's sometimes a little bit of a lack of respect for each other's ways of working um it's it's really tricky um but i think when it's done well it's it's fantastic and it totally pays off and i think it, it it's so easy to make make this e um, make this sound easier than it is interdisciplinary research it's really difficult to do and it takes time and it takes a lot of investment um, and I think that becomes more and more true when you're talking about those far disciplines. Ian? Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd agree. I, I think I'd probably argue that um, it maybe is more perception be from our point of view, because um, we see a lot. And as I mentioned in my introduction, we fund a lot of social science as an integral part of, of our medical research. Um, we have to be very careful. I, I agree that things shouldn't be bolted on at the end. They need um, to be in there at the start and there needs to be some co-production really between the, the, the different disciplines. And we'll often in difficult and tricky areas, for instance, um, I, I can, uh, you know, one good example is the UK Prevention Research Partnership, um, which brings together uh, quite a few uh, disciplines, certainly a, a heavy social science um, uh, component. And just like um, uh, patient involvement, it needs to be done right at the start. And we're, if it's a tricky area, we'll often fund some sort of development or networking to start things off with a promise of um, consortia being formed around the most promising and, and, and quickly progressing ideas um, in that area. So that's certainly how the, the prevention partnership, which I think has over a dozen funders involved in it, um, uh, that's how that's structured. So they'll do some networking and then um, and then fund some consortia coming out of that at a later date. Okay. Natalie. I, I, I've got to jump in there because I think if I nodded anymore, my head would fall off. <laughs> I, it, you know, it, it's a subject that's really close to, to my heart. I, before I came to Pfizer, I, I was a surgeon and I did a PhD using qualitative research. And so, you know, I'm surprised they, they didn't just string me up for that, you know, because surgeons aren't always the biggest fan of social sciences. But I think the point here is you have to think is what is the end goal? And it comes back to what I was saying is the end goal is not necessarily to develop the, the, the latest wonderful molecule or you know understand one specific thing the, the end goal from from our perspective is to have that make a difference to patients right and to do that you know you need to bring in aspects of understanding patient perspectives as you said you know you need your, your ppi involvement and that's often led through a social science lens you need to understand behavioral impact of you know or as it deals with with adherence so you know, it, it is a perceptual thing, I think. And yes, it can be difficult to bridge that gap. But if the end goal is to improve human health, then we need to bring in that perspective. Okay, thanks. Okay, another question points out that this year in particular, there's been a lot of focus on emerging challenges such as COVID-19 and, and global warming. Um, can the panelists say anything about how this will affect ex existing concerns such as and cancer, dementia, cardiovascular research? I mean, are, are they equally, will they equally benefit from interdisciplinary research? Stunned silence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You just yes, beat me I mean, to it. <laughs> I, I, I think the thing is, I mean, a good example might be that um, the real acceleration in cancer therapies recently has come from um, immunology. And you, you can argue about the definitions of the disciplines and what, what, where did it arrive and so on. But, um, you know, we often got criticised for having a lot of immunology research in the UK. We've traditionally been a really strong place to do immunology um, because of things like, you know, 
who, who knew before the pandemic, actually the burden of infectious disease in the UK was pretty, pretty low. So, so research on immunology and, and infectious diseases and so on was starting to get some criticism. So you, um, but you, need, you needed that strength and you didn't ever know what would spin out of it. And it's been wonderful for, for you know, as say, uh, advances in, in cancer therapy and so on. So this whole new field of cancer immunology, um, which, is, which is burgeoning. So it's, it's just the, um, uh, I think uh, we, we see advances in one area nearly always benefit others. Makes sense, yeah. Okay, so another question from the participants. Many of the panelists talked about the value of building trust and relationships to have cross-sectoral experience. What mechanisms would the panelists recommend to support this, especially when researchers have pressure to be productive, i.e. produce papers? I can start off maybe maybe thinking about that. So, I mean, I think from a Pfizer perspective, and, and it's something we're looking increasingly at is, you know, how we look at potentially funding some doctoral positions, how we look at, you know, um, doing um, secondments as, as, as you said, Ian. So we, we have placements where, where people say are on formal doctoral positions, but have a, a time in, in, in industry. I, I think, you know, there are a lot of, of potential mechanisms there, certainly from my perspective, to get that, that, that cross-sector working. I think uh, a lot of it is about the, the, the openness to, to be prepared to, to, to work in that way. And of course, the more we work in that way, the more trust we build. And again, that, 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 just, that just accelerates. Okay, that seems fine. So obviously, some of, many of us come from the perspective of the physiological society. So I wondered what the panelists could suggest that what more can learned societies and other professional organizations do to promote interdisciplinary research? Ian? Well, I suppose I wanted to build a bit more on, 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 on Natalie's point and the fact that um, the, the answer is around um, sort of, again, we come back to research culture and a, a, a positive research culture. And um, you know, one, one initiative that the UKRI is really keen on, but actually came from a learning society, is the resume for researchers. Um, so a new way of, of, of looking at researcher CVs and um, giving people um, recognition and, and acknowledgement for their wider contributions, not just publishing papers and getting new grants, but actually are they a good scientific citizen? Um, are, they, could, are they participating in peer review? Are they training other researchers? Those sorts of things we really do need to um, provide more acknowledgement for. So I think um, uh, you know, learned societies have been um, fantastic in, in doing some of that thinking and catalyzing um, the, 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 the um, you know, new initiatives around recognizing the varied career pathways that are out there. Um, so, I, and, and just as you know, the Academy of Medical Sciences did all that work on team science some time ago as well, um, you know, I think um, the, the societies are a great powerhouse for this sort of um, stimulating thinking about it. Okay. I wonder if I could put the president of the Physiological Society on the spot, or is that unfair? No, it's probably quite appropriate. Put me on the spot. Well, I, I think with the learner societies, like we, we can obviously do a much, much more with this, as, as Ian has already pointed out. And I think, actually, we are, because we're having this event this evening, um, which is hopefully opening everyone's mind and broadening their horizons. And, but at the end of the day, it, it depends if one wants a career in academia or not. And that, that's only one side of being a graduate. And 
one has to change the culture of the employing environment. You know, and industry is much better at doing this than academia. Academia, on the whole, as we know, moves rather slowly. It is driven by an odd metrics culture, which has appeared in the United Kingdom only quite recently since the birth of the RAE, which then morphed into the REF, which is what this report is all about. And in many ways, that, that exercise has been a double-edged sword, I think, for many people in terms of career progression going forward. And there have been many beneficiaries, but also other people have not done well under that assessment exercise because it is very narrow and it doesn't capture breadth uh, as well as it should do, which is what your report has beautifully um, highlighted. So I really hope that UKRI and the powers to be in Research England really have a careful look at what is the problem they're trying to solve with REF going forward as a bigger concept because for many of us, and like you, David, I've sat on these panels for a couple of exercises. And in many ways in the sciences, we kind of know the answer before we start the exercise. Yet we're quite happy to spend hundreds of millions of pounds on this. And one would wonder, talking to the science minister, whether that money could be actually better spent as a direct input into the science itself, rather than the administration of something where you know the answer already. So that's my apolitical point, which I would just like to make for you. Many thanks. So this neatly takes us on to our next question, which I think I'll warn you, Ian has got your name on it. In light of the indisputable need for more IDR, requiring larger funding support for building larger delivery teams, do you think the current bidding system cost, is cost effective? With success rates, success rates in single digit percentages, shouldn't we think of an alternative approach that allows for more time and support to develop interdisciplinary teams and deliver the research? Yeah, well, I mean, if I could start with that one then, and um, I think, yes, I mean, um, we, a lot of what we're discussing is around, um, uh, you know, things would be better if we had more funding. And I think Stephanie was very optimistic, uh, you know, very positive, quite rightly, about the spending review settlement. And and I am too, that's the right direction um, for, for funding to be increased. And that will give us more scope to fund more interdisciplinary research. Um, uh, indeed, if you fund things in bigger chunks, then it is more cost effective, the administration of, of, of um, supporting that research. Uh, that's part of the argument of the, the REF exercise is, is it's justified because you're, you're allocating um, very large amounts of money um, over a six year or so period. So, um, so yeah, it's cost effective. And of course there are recent arguments about setting up, for instance, the new um, advanced um, research and innovation agency, um, which will have a very streamlined, meant to have a very streamlined way, um, light touch way of assessing um, bids for for um, for funding. So that's an, another alternative route for funding things um, in a rapid way. But I would say that, you know, when um, we needed to, through uh, the COVID pandemic, we pretty quickly turned around um, funding proposals and, um, and got the money to where it was needed. Um, as, as much money as we had available. So um, so I think um, not really an answer, except we use a variety of approaches and, um, and you know, we, we, uh, we hope we try and get it right. Um, uh, more money and we can fund more things. Thanks very much. Steph? Um, it's, it's an interesting question because I don't think we've ever sat down and said, what does the right, success rate look like so we know what they are but what do we what do we want them to look like and this is a question that came up when we did our report um, into research culture and we spoke to researchers and they said that you know 
the 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 un sort of unpaid time that goes into bidding for a search project isn't sort of factored in. It's something you're expected to do, but something that's not covered unless you unless you count QR as part of that. So I think it's a bigger question that we probably need to take time to sit down and say, well, what do we what do we want success rates to look like? When it comes to efficiency, I mean, I would say this um, from the perspective of the Russell Group, we've always seen um, QR or quality related funding um, as being absolutely essential in that if you um, if you have interesting programs with promise that you want to fund, you know, in interdisciplinary research can, can be an example of that, then you can put funding behind it without going through this, this big process. And I think again, it, since we're all mentioning COVID, I think one of the one of the case studies actually that's used in the report um, from King's was an example of where um, uh, the ventilators I think got regulatory approval before the first um, UKRI rapid response bids were were put forward, and that's not the fault of UKRI. It was done really quickly, but that's how fast you can go when you have that flexibility. So we'd of course make make the case for that. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting uh, wider question that touches across research culture, which has been raised several times um, today. Ian, do you want to come back? Yes, just to, to just to add, I suppose that, um, that yeah, through the COVID response, we certainly you know there were there were things done before the rapid response even um, uh, was was announced. So so where we have, for instance. Um, our, our intramural program our units and institutes, we could of course allocate funds to those very quickly, just uh, you know, akin to a university being able to deploy QR funding um, to, to its, its, um, its programs. And of course, with a lot of programs pivoted, given the need that, um, that there was to reallocate their efforts to, to COVID. Um, but I think um, actually we need to we, we need to better understand what works actually as far as funding across all of these kind of aspects and um, we're very good uh, in UKRI and in the research councils at coming up with um, supposedly better ideas to fund things um, and we we actually uh, something that's close to my heart is um, is doing better experiments actually um, and um, and when we do implement something that we think is a better way of funding something. Actually, we ought to be doing uh, some control experiments here. And so, um, so we ought to be launching new initiatives, but with, with uh, an aspect of, of evaluation built in there so that, um, so that we, 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 we test whether it's a good idea. So we, we want to experiment more. And um, we've just recently launched a study um, to look very carefully at the costs and benefits of the, um, the, the, the grant allocation process, right from idea to, to award. And so that will be, um, that that's already underway and um, you know, researchers applying to UKRI, certainly for EPSRC and MRC grants towards the end of the year, may well find themselves enrolled in that kind of study to, um, to provide us information about what the costs and benefits of each stage are, which will hopefully allow us to design um, more effective instruments for funding in future. Great. Just, just as a quick note, I, I was chuckling because it, it sounds like a classic quality improvement problem. And, you know, you should be speaking to the quality improvement methodologists, you know. <laughs> That's truly interdisciplinary, yes. Absolutely. OK, so the panel has very patiently address lots of questions. I'm just going to go around you quickly and turn. Are there any final parting words you want to give to the group of people on Zoom? I think just for me, it's a con thought, following on from David's comments earlier around REF, bringing it back to that question of, about the future and thinking about things like the balance across outputs and environment and impact. We've had quite a lot of the discussion today has talked around that. And um, I, I guess there is a question there about what the, the future balance might be for a, a REF that supports uh, interdisciplinary research. Anybody else? I think just an observation, and that is there's no such thing as a perfect metric or a perfect way of measuring things. And, you know, you do your best, you constantly try to move the envelope, get it better. The point is you do have to measure something to improve things. 
but it really does come back to that piece again around culture and it's about the culture of wanting to learn wanting to do better and wanting to improve so i think it's really about embracing that as as, as everyone i think has said okay i think i think i'd add to that um that yes ref's been mentioned several times this evening but a piece of advice um I heard from David Price, who's the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Research at UCL, was that the you know ref ref might not exist in its current form in a few years' time. You know there will always be a different assessment system out there. The important thing to remember as a researcher is to do excellent research with impact. You know, go out there, build good teams, be a good model. <laughs> you know foster positive research culture and you will be fine i think at times as a community we do obsess about these things um, and and we mustn't forget what's important as long as you can get it funded well i think his argument was the funding will come if you get those things right and in place thanks thanks so much i i just like to end up by thanking First of all, all the participants who've given up their early part of their evening, but in particular, the panelists who I think have given us the benefit of their experience and wisdom. And I've already thought that they've touched on lots of areas that I think could be the basis of whole new discussions. I mean, I hadn't before thought enough about the links between experimental science and the social sciences. Some of the things we talked about international de developments are also very important. And last but not least, I look forward very much to seeing how the MRC and UKRI are going to do their experiment to see which method of funding works best. But on that note, thank you all so much. Goodbye. <laughs>